And now, an eighth special presentation. Today on Art Beat Nation, the fiber art is taking over. They're making magazines about it. They're having shows right now about it, so you can't get more contemporary than that. We check out the nation's only Spanish-speaking conservatory. Then you give access to these artists to be the best they can be in the language that they're most comfortable speaking. Learn the joy of getting lost in the music. I really am in my own world of just me, my piano, and, and the music. And we take in a historic and cultural gem. Robertson's collection is really encyclopedic. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. The fiber arts are frequently associated with old-fashioned quilting and crochet, but in our first segment, we learn its burgeoning place in the contemporary art world. Join us as we visit three artists who are changing the meaning of this traditional medium. This is a 24 harness dobby loom. It has a 60 inch weaving width, which means I could weave anywhere from one inch to 60 inches. I got into the felt and really like working with it because I can sculpt it in a very similar way that I can sculpt clay. The color palette is very similar and then I can add bright and exciting colors really easily. Um, without fire, um, without heavy machinery. My artwork is about life interactions between different people and I like to use fiber as my medium because it's like the human body, it's natural and it'll wear away with time. Before you can put anything on the loom, you actually have to think about what do I want to weave? What do I want to create? You have to formulate prior to execution. I might cut a six inch piece of yarn, put it in, and add that as just a highlight. That's not happening in your, your mills, your industrial mills. That's where the spontaneity comes in. It stems from the idea of vessels, containment, and has actually kind of gravitated towards nesting and more domestic-centered activities. I think partially because of the mediums that I'm using, which are string, security envelopes, candles that I melt down to get wax for. So my bruises are mostly just little life incidents, like someone who fell off a bike, or my friend who got a bruise because they were dancing and they fell in the bushes. It makes an impact in your life, but you heal from it and you just remember it. Like these are all French knots, followed by um, a running stitch embroidery. And I like to have it kind of off place because on your body it just shows up wherever. So it's not always gonna be like right there in the middle of your hand or something. I think when it comes to fiber, most people in the art community don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to hang it. They don't know what context it comes in. I think fiber is a medium that a lot of people just kind of glance over because they think of it in like fashion terms or weaving, how it's just a fabric or how it's kind of like crafty, home ecky kind of thing. Yes, my great aunt makes quilts. That's great, they're beautiful. The patterns are traditional, but I don't see how there couldn't be a place for it if people are doing it. And they're making magazines about it, they're having shows right now about it, so you can't get more contemporary than that. And we're trying to show that fiber is a viable medium. To learn more about fiber art, check out your local art museum. Love reveals its true face in Cyrano Mio, a Spanish adaptation of the French original. Up next, we sit down with the cast and crew at Miami's Teatro Prometeo, the country's only Spanish language conservatory, for a behind the scenes look. Prometeo Theatre is the nation's 
uh, only Spanish language theater conservatory. It's been around for 40 years and has produced amazing actors and playwrights and directors and really important part of this nation's cultural history as well. We're mainly a school, we're a conservatory. Uh, we have a very strong two-year professional program. The idea behind it is to be able to provide a really strong education in the arts in Spanish as they would receive in English. And when you do that, then you give access to these artists to be the best they can be in the language that they're most comfortable speaking. When I first auditioned, I took the class and I fell in love with my professors and with the program. I have taken acting classes but when I was little and in high school, but this was my first time taking classes as really deep professional and going into deep stuff about a character. When I started, I just knew how to do little stuff on TV. But when you start studying theater, you go, more deep. If you want to be an actor, you have to know theater at least, and you have to have the ground to be an actor. And on this school, that's what I found. I found a really, really good base because you have passion people. They give you part of their, of their souls. We have six actors. They do nine characters, and it's done in about an hour. It's a play about love. It's a play about wanting to express what you have inside, but being afraid. The production is coming up with Cyrano Mio, and I play Roxanne. Roxanne, she's very passionate and romantic, and I'm like that. <laughs> I'm very corny. You know, I like all the romantic stuff, the letters, the love letters, and the text. So, I mean, <laughs> it's really, it has a lot of, of me. Al aire al rojo, el sombrero. And I'm Cyrano. Cyrano de Bergerac. Cyrano is a really deep character. He's a philosopher, he's a sword fighter, he's a poetry. He's a really a person in love. Cyrano is the fearless, the fearless person. That's pretty much how we relate. In today's age of texting and this and that and the other, sometimes you're trying to connect but you actually feel more alone. And I think here it's really beautiful to see somebody really struggle for the love of another person. And really find the courage to say that face to face because that's, that's the hardest thing. The challenging part was to go through the whole process of the suffering because of loving someone. And this play, since I play a year after Cyrano's death, I have to go back and forth with my feelings. So I go from the present to the past. I have to switch from being crying to like the moment, just the, the memory of the person, which you cry, but it's not as much because it's been a year. It still hurts, but not as much as the past. Bravo. The fight scene is the one that I like it. We learned Screamer for six months. We have a scene that I'm fighting with Balber. He's defending uh, Roxanne's honor, you know. We do all our performances in Spanish, but there are English super titles. People start looking at the super titles at the beginning, and about maybe 10 minutes in, I notice that nobody's reading them anymore and everybody is completely connected into the performance. My friends always come when I have performances. My best friends, they, they always support me. We have the super titles, but they're not even reading. I'm like, Claudia, it's just the performance and your facial expressions says everything. <laughs> they laugh, so that's a good sign for the, you know, they're understanding everything, even if it's in a different language. Prometeo is sold. Prometeo, it's passion. Prometeo, it's the truth. Que es un beso al fin y al cabo, sino un juramento callado. Una tierna promesa carnal, un deseo confirmado. Un secreto que en vez de a un oído se le dice a una boca. Una forma de saborear el corazón del otro y de respirar por un momento el alma amada. That's, you know, some part of the point that he says to, to her. Come see Cyrano Mio. It's a wonderful play. It's a wonderful experience. Come and take a class and come and be a part of this family. For more information, visit prometeotheater.com.
Up next, we follow the music to Denver, Colorado, where pianist Katie Mahan is ascending new heights in the world of classical piano. We sit down with the rising star and follow her development from enthusiastic student to world-class performer. Music was always pretty much the center of my household. When we wake up in the morning, she turns on music. We always had music in our home, classical music. My mom was a musician. She wanted to start me when I was two or three years old with the piano, but I didn't have a lot of interest, and then I attended a concert when I was four. And she came up to Bob and afterwards and said, I want to be a professional pianist. I decided from that moment that that's what I wanted to do with my life, and I actually started piano the next day, and it's always been my biggest, biggest passion. And she's never wavered in this desire to, to do what she loves. When I was in school, I was always known as the piano girl. She would go to kindergarten in the morning and then come home and practice until dinner time. So five to six hours, and it was love. She was curious. We would have a lesson, and then she would want more. She performed for everyone, anyone that would come to the house. So her first recital was nothing more than just another performance. My first recital was when I was six years old. At that age, of course, you don't really have any nerves. It's exciting, and I love to be out there on stage and be the center of attention, you know, as a little six-year-old. Katie took it as a child that was just fascinated and gleeful, and she was so proud of herself, and she knew she could do it. This is kind of my warm-up for every day. Music is putting ideas through sound, and to create ideas through sound takes imagination. The more variance that you can have, the more imagination that you can have. This amazing instrument has so many variation of, of colors and, and tones. There's a lot of sounds that can be produced by the piano that other instruments cannot produce. The piano is, to me, a complete instrument. It's the orchestra in 88 keys. An emphasis on colors is one thing that you really learn from French Impressionistic music. Creating colors in music is a lot like creating colors in art. You translate something that you see visually and something that you can hear. And with the piano, there's so many ways to make colors. If you strike a piano like this, you have a very brilliant tone. So you could imagine that that's bright red. Or you can play it very gently and very softly. You have the same chord, but maybe it's now a lilac color. So it, everything depends on the instrument, how you touch it, whether you strike it or whether you push into it or whether you caress it, and also how you use the pedal because you can have a very dry sound with no pedal, you can have a very wet sound, and you can also make it very quiet by adding a soft pedal. So my mother was my first teacher until I was 18 years old. I believe my piano teaching influenced Katie in that I was always there for her. When she wanted to know how to do this chord or that chord, I was there for her. Not only was she my teacher, but we did a lot of chamber music together. We have done duo piano since she was five years old. A lot of times growing up, a, a soloist spends all the time by themselves, you know, which of course is, is necessary with practicing, but I got to share that a lot of times by doing to piano with my mom and you know it was a lot of fun and we've always had a really a nice rapport working together. I've actually been teaching piano since I was 13 years old. My first students were the little brothers and sisters of some of my mom's older students. I always have loved to teach. I think it's so important for any musician to do everything they possibly can to carry on the art, to carry it forward. My passion is being on stage but I also love to watch young children start from the beginning and develop an interest in music and develop an interest in knowing who Beethoven is and who Mozart is. For me, some of the most important things in life are to know about Bach and Chopin and what they gave to the world. When she plays, I go into the music. 
I don't watch her particularly. I try to just listen to the music and her performance of it. I used to be the nervous father, and sometimes I would not even want to be in the concert hall when she was playing because I was afraid she would, you know, make a mistake. I had my fingers crossed and my legs crossed and everything, and I've long since graduated from that. Now I can come in and I sit back and relax and absorb it all. There's a happy medium between corresponding with your audience, making sure that they are a part of the whole music making aspect, but on the other hand, to really communicate what you want as an artist, you have to create your own little world up there. And so, you know, when I perform, I really try never to look at my audience directly. You know, I really am in my own world of just me, my piano, and, and the music. When I walk out on stage, I give everything of myself. It's my favorite way of communicating, actually, because I can share all the emotions that I have, and beyond that, I can share the music that I love and help to keep it alive. She plays with so much passion and sensitivity. It's just a joy to, to hear her. I always have felt so blessed to be a musician, to have this gift, because music is something for every possible feeling that you can have. It's just such a wonderful gift for the soul and for the mind. It's just been one long journey of joy. The point of music is it's a reflection of time and people and emotions and, you know, I think everything that you have in life it can be included somehow in music. And so when I play a piece of music, it's not just notes and sounds. It represents everything that I am and it represents everything that I believe. And I love it so much that I want to share that passion that I have with my audience. Matisse, Dolly, and Picasso are just a few of the leading artists whose work is featured at the Robertson Museum in Binghamton, New York. We take a look inside this stunning mansion turned art museum. McDonald, Executive Director of Robertson Museum and Science Center. And I'm Jason Fumi, the Marketing and Public Relations Director for Robertson Museum and Science Center. We want to welcome you to the historic Robertson Mansion. Robertson is a gift to the community in everything we do with our exhibitions, our programs, the collections that we have on display, especially that in the Treasures of the Vault. But it all began here with this beautiful, beautiful mansion. The Robertson Mansion opened to the public in 1954. The Robertsons had willed it to be a place for community engagement and learning with a focus on arts history and science education. And that carries over into our mission today where we offer programs and events and oftentimes use the mansion for these programs that maintain engagement of people of all ages and backgrounds for art history and science education programs. This location really highlights the work of Mr. Robertson. He was a lumber baron, and we often say that the designs within various rooms here were his marketing tool. He was able to bring people in here to show them the work that they could have in their own home done by his company. As you go room to room, you'll see all kinds of different detail, all kinds of different woodwork, and even the type of wood that's used. The Robertson Mansion has many features. Uh, first floor, second floor, third floor, big ballroom, uh, a library space, a study, a fabulous dining room, the staircase. One of the features that you'll notice a lot of as you walk through are fireplaces. The mansion is full of 11 fireplaces all throughout. Uh, pretty impressive considering only two people lived here, just Mr. and Mrs. Robertson. They didn't have any kids. In their servants' quarter, they averaged about five to seven servants at a time. But again, all of this beautiful wonder enjoyed by just Alonzo and Margaret Robertson. We 
try to utilize this uh, space year round. It, it really was meant to be for community enjoyment. So whether it's for our New Year's Eve masquerade party or when we're decking it out for Home for the Holidays, this mansion absolutely transforms and it's as much for the community to enjoy as it is for us to enjoy. This beautiful gallery is exhibiting a program that we're calling Treasures of the Vault. And this was really intended to celebrate all the gifts that have been given to Robertson over time. Unlike many museums, when Robertson was open to the public, it was not founded originally as a museum, but as a community center. And so the collections that Robertson owns primarily have come as gifts from the community. Robertson contains some collections that could be anywhere in any museum in the world. Some of them, including those that came from the Victoria Levine collection, include objects from ancient Greece and Rome. They're beautiful works, very, very valuable, and we're very pleased to have them. Some of the other objects that we have are smaller works by very well-known artists. We have works by Matisse, by Dali, and Picasso here as well. Robertson is the only museum in this region that is American Alliance of Museums accredited. It's very important to us that we maintain our collections in ways that are proper in the museum business. We underwent, just a couple of years ago, a complete inventory of all of our collections. We've digitized the collections that we own here. We wanted to be able to showcase the work that we've done, bring some of these great treasures up for the world to see. We're very proud of the works that we have here on display. Robertson's collection is really encyclopedic. We have a touch screen as part of the exhibit that really features the floor plan of the exhibit itself and offers you an opportunity to really delve in a little bit deeper to the collections that we have. For example, if you wanted to look at some of the works that we have from ancient Greece and identify it on the map here, you could click on this to look at this Greek amphora and how it is figured in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collections. We can do this with a number of the pieces that are here, and it features works that are available in the MoMA and the British Museum. It's really incredible in a museum our size to have such a fantastic collection and to be able to allow our visitors to see them firsthand. We are in the expanded model train layout here at Robertson. We're proud to say that we have the largest publicly accessible model train layout in the region. It took about a year and a half of thousands of hours of volunteer work to put this together, and it really highlights details of Binghamton, Endicott, Johnson City, Susquehanna, PA, and it's a labor of love, and it's done by community members who really take interest in Robertson, interest in the hobby of train building. We feature an awesome model train show, which gets thousands of people each year, and to be able to highlight the past and present of our community in such a layout that's on permanent display is a really big deal for us. I think one of the things you'll find most interesting about this layout is the attention to detail by our volunteers. You'll see things that are very familiar, especially if you're from or familiar with the area. You'll see IBM, but you also see Elk's Bake Shop, and oftentimes we hear from people who say that they used to get their birthday cakes from Elk's when they were a kid. You see an old Olam store that's got a flickering TV inside. We've got all kinds of things representing Pennsylvania. As you look at the Strucca Viaduct, neatly composed, it's got every arc in there that is actually represented in the official structure. So you come in here, you can spend a lot of time looking at all the details that we have. For more information, visit Robertson.org. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.